You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. Greetings from beautiful Lake Manitow in Rochester, Indiana. Ed's not here, but I am. No, I'm not there. <laughs> I'm not there, and your facial hair is not there either. No, no, it's really no. no I have a. I have no, we we can see each other. People can't see you, obviously, on a podcast. It's audio only. But um, uh, Chris's face, which is not normally that off-putting, is now. Um, just it it doesn't look. I right. have a baby yeah. face. I have a baby face. You do. So I like. I, here's the thing. My nine year olds never see me with my facial hair gone. And trust me, you'll see another video soon on YouTube. And I may not grow it back right away. So maybe you'll get a chance to see what this looks like. Uh, he cried. He was like, "Dad, what did you do to your face?" Because I shaved my face while I was up there at the lake. Because we were doing a murder mystery thing. My mother, like, organized this whole thing, and everybody had to dress up and play a character and solve the murder. Which, by the way, I'm the person who solved the murder. And everybody thought it was me, and I was like, it is definitely not me. And I was able to pick out well, who it was. Wasn't your character like a mafia don yeah. or something like that? Right. So I had to have a pencil-thin mustache. And I was like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make that natural. It'll be funny. And after you've been drinking all day at the lake, that seems like a good idea. So, so, so I, I shaved everything down to the pencil-thin mustache, went and did it. And then this morning when I woke up, everybody looked at me and said, you look really creepy with that. You're not going to keep that, are you? So then I finished shaving, and now I have this clean face. And that's probably the first time in almost 10 years since I've had a clean face. And I, I'm not even used to it either. So, And nobody can see it because we're doing a podcast, but maybe very soon you'll see it while I'm out in public. Because I don't know. I might keep it. My, my sister's telling me I look young this way. I don't know. I think I look well, weird. That, that can be true. Yeah. I mean, I, I know... I. People tell me that that because my beard is gray but my hair is still dark, relatively speaking, that the beard ages me. Oh, the beard makes you look older. Yeah, you got like a white beard. You're like Santa Claus. You, you, however, you, then yeah. they also tell me that um, they, they tell me that I look really terrible yeah. without a beard. So, <laughs> all right, let's let's talk White Sox baseball here because uh, you know I'm, I'm still up here. I'm still paying attention to the to the Sox. Uh, and and one of the things that I noticed right away was the whole story about Luis Robert Jr. not throwing in a, a ball at the end of a game, trying to make a play at the plate. Uh, and and we had just talked about on Sunday that he had I had mentioned it in my little diatribe towards the end of the last show that he was going station to station in that extra inning game when I felt like he probably could have taken an extra base in there at some point, and then he catches a ball flat-footed in the outfield that was in shallow center field, and he's unable to make a good throw on it. And now this time around, he gets the it's the end of the game against the Guardians, and he is again flat-footed, backpedaling almost, not getting that momentum that I think anybody who's ever played baseball, watched baseball, talked about baseball with anybody, and seen somebody set up to throw a guy out from from the outfield and and knows that it's best to be kind of running in timing the catch on the move putting everything you can into the throw and making an attempt to get the guy out we don't see any of that at the end of the game and we haven't seen that from him before we've seen this before end of a game ball goes over his head he really doesn't move if he doesn't think he can throw the guy out Game's over at that point. And I, I I understand Sox fans saying, well, I want to see the effort. And I want to see the effort, too. Like, here's the thing. I don't expect him to throw out that runner. I want to say that was Jimenez from from the Guardians, and he's pretty fast. I, I, I'm not sure if he really has a chance to get him at home. But I would like to see him setting up under the ball with that little skip where you're coming up where you're winding up almost ready to throw it, where you're catching it on the move, you're going into one fluid motion, and you're trying to get one off. Because what if the runner stumbles? What if something happens and now the ball comes in and you're able to make a play and something exciting happens? And it feels like in the middle of a really bad season, a very good player who has had his struggles with injuries and his batting average isn't that high, even though he is contributing to the majority of runs this team scores week to week while he's out there on the field – Maybe the season's getting to him because I'm hoping that's the explanation. I'm hoping it's like, hey, everything else around here sucks. The manager holds nobody else accountable, so why should I worry about it? it, To me, it was a more damning thing on Pedro that your star player's in the outfield, and that's the effort at the end of the game. That's that's how I felt. Yeah, and I think part of this is is that, like you say, it's it's the perception of effort maybe more so than – 
the actual whether or not the play would be made, right? It's the perception of not even bothering to throw a ball in and trying to make a play. I mean, you know, if that ball comes in and it gets to home plate and, you know, the Guardians are already celebrating the, the, the run scoring or the Rockies are already celebrating the run scoring, then it doesn't matter – but at least you saw some effort, I guess. And and I think what we're looking at, when you look at a, a franchise that can best be described as moribund, right? You know, we're, we're, we're looking at a lame duck manager who does not seem to, to get it. We're looking at a roster full of guys that we don't think have a future here. And and then, yeah, the the rub off on Luis Roberts Jr., who does have a future here, who who is the guy that you're building around, the rub off on him is how much does it matter? Now, you know, that same play, that same effort in a season where they're already winning and, you know, you look at it and you go, okay, well, you know, that ball gets out to him. He knows he's got no prayer of, of, of getting the guy at home. It doesn't really matter. You know, it doesn't matter um, whether he throws it in or not. You know, watching a ball go over your head, giving up on a play where it's like, you know, I'm not going to make it anyway and this is going to be a walk-off situation. We see players do that all the time, but I think when – a team is losing, right? And you have no hope for the future when you're looking at the franchise. You just sit there and you go, okay, well, but the guys that we do want to have around that we are supposed to root for, if they're not putting out max effort every single game, then why are we even bothering with them, right? It, it, I think it's just a natural reaction as a fan to sit there and say, if you're going to sleepwalk through this, then why should we care? And th- and I think that's a pretty valid argument for you know, not benching Luis Robert Jr., not saying that he's a terrible player and you got to rush him off the team or making assumptions about what he's going to do in a better situation. But I do think as a fan, it's a natural response. And frankly, I, you know, I can appreciate hustle at any time, whether you're winning or losing. So even yeah, that's true of, of really any sport. I mean, if, if I'm watching hockey and I know the Blackhawks have no talent last year, but you know, if they seem to be playing hard, they seem to be skating hard. It was like, well, at least it's, it's something, right? You can, you can hang your hat on that. I just want to see the right technical way to play the the position, right? I mean, like, well, fundamentals it, it wouldn't are, are key. Me, it wouldn't bother me as much if I hadn't just watched him on Sunday catch a ball flat-footed. I think Guillen talked about it on the post game too. I didn't see it, but I saw some people commenting on social media that Guillen was all over him, like this is the second time this week I've seen it. And, you know, watching the game, just as a fan, watching him where – there's going to be a play. He may want to make a throw home. Uh, you want to challenge the runner, and and he's catching a ball flat-footed or moving backwards when he should have the momentum going forward. Like you know, I mean, I remember a, a Ken Griffey Jr. at the end of his career with not a lot in that arm anymore in game 163, throwing on Michael Kadire, and it bounced four times before it got there, but it was dead on, and he had all that momentum when he got there. And that's why that play was made to hold that one one nothing lead that eventually went on to becoming a White Sox winner. And, and and he was fundamentally out there. And I know it's a big moment. Okay, it's a very different moment. It's a there, playoff game. It's a, it's fun, yeah. yeah, but but fundamentally, a professional center fielder making the play. You have to wonder after you've seen this a couple times from Robert Jr. Do teams eventually have a book on him that says, hey? Get ready to tag up and go because he is not in the right position when there's a fly ball out to the outfield. Just like it was obvious in the game that I watched on Sunday that if a ball was going out in the air towards Tommy Pham, the runners were going to run the moment he caught it because he doesn't have the arm to throw it in. Would the book end up being eventually on Robert? Hey, a lot of times he's not in the right spot, in the right position, not set up correctly to be able to throw you out. So be ready to tag because we're running on him. And, and I wonder if that'll end up becoming a thing because I'm starting to see at least a little bit of a pattern here this season. And I don't know if that's if that's all him being miserable on a bad team. And it, some of that might actually be he also is just not doing the right thing fundamentally out there. And then whose job is it to go and grab your your so, your superstar and say, hey, what are you doing out here? Well, it's the manager's job. I, I mean, plain and simple, it, it's whether he's a superstar or not, if if that is the case, if his fundamentals are lacking, that's the coaching staff's prerogative and uh, purview to, to sit there and say, hey, look, this is not correct. You got to do these things the right way and not rely on your athletic ability and not rely on uh, just, you know, natural God-given talent to carry you through, but to sit there and say, we do expect you to be in a position to make the catch and put in a strong, accurate throw 
back into the infield, back to home plate if if there's a chance, like you said earlier, if the runner stumbles, okay, or if the runner wasn't going to go, or if the runner gets caught flat-footed and isn't ready, whatever the reason is, be in a position, a fundamentally good position, plus just we're just going to be a fundamentally sound team, so practice your fundamentals in the field. And it's the same thing running the bases. It's the same thing setting up the plate offensively. If the fundamentals aren't there, then the coaching staff has to sit each player down or the players as a group and sit there and say, just, you know, do things the way you're trained to do them. Do things the right way. Do things the proper way. Do it. Do it the right way. It feels like that's what the philosophy of the White Sox is. Like, hey, hey, do it the right way. What's the right way? Ah, we don't know. We, we could be teaching it all throughout, the ma- all throughout the minor league system. We should have been teaching it that way for the last 20 years, but we really have no consistency. Well, so, and I mean, that's like, part that's, of the problem, right? <laughs> that, that's part of the problem is, is that there, there is no consistency. And then also, honestly, uh, if you know that Pedro Grifol is probably done, why are you listening to him? I, I, you know, no, you, you wouldn't listen to him. Yeah. Why, why, why you, would anybody? You, would not. You, you, know, you, you know your boss is going to be fired. You don't necessarily pay attention to that boss, right? You, you pay attention to, in this case, Luis Robert Jr. is probably more in tune with what Chris Getz thinks of him and whether or not he's going to get traded than he is with what Pedro Grifol or anybody on the coaching staff thinks about him and thinks about his effort. So I don't know, you know, I don't know the mindset of the man to, to, to be able to tell you one way or the other why he looks so lackadaisical out there and why he's catching things flat-footed and not doing things fundamentally right in the field. And I think, you know, the guess is as good as any is that he's just checked out and realizes that none of it matters. And, you know, if he throws that guy out at home plate, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to win the game because they've shown an inability to win extra inning games. They've shown in, you right, know, right. It, it's he's just, probably sitting there though. So- He's he's thinking to himself, well, you know, I could get this guy out, but then I have to stand out here for another twenty minutes and wait to lose another way. Right. Oh my goodness. I really you you really hope you really hope that that is not you really hope that is not the mentality. Uh, you want a positive mentality. You want people to do things right. You want consistency. Let's say forty years in Oak Forest doing it right. Window and door superstore of Oak Forest. Exterior windows, doors, patio doors, storm doors. No high pressure sales. They're not in your kitchen. They're in their showroom with full examples. Glass designs on display. No pictures in a book. See it all in person with the owner in showroom and on site. All window and door superstore installers. They don't farm out the work. All major brands. Custom made with no stock items for a perfect fit. They are a half block east of 159th and Ridgeland at 6280 159th Street. Window and Door Superstore of Oak Forest. See more at windowdooroakforest.com. You saw the promotions uh, that were just announced. A couple different guys coming up. They're, they're very different in terms of what they mean in the immediate to the White Sox, right. at least in my opinion, right? You have Kai Bush coming up to AAA from AA. You see Edgar Caro go up, and you see Brooks Baldwin go up, right? You see these three guys, they all get themselves promoted, and they move up. Now, what's interesting is Kai Bush, I think, is one of the next guys to come up here and, and get a crack at the staff. Like, I think if you look at him and Mason Adams and what Mason Adams has been doing down in AA, uh, those may be the next two guys that legit have a chance to walk in here and be part of the the staff or at least be part of the pitching staff as a whole, okay? Maybe they end up in the bullpen, but you're hoping that they turn into viable starting pitching options. And so, again, that shows the depth of the of the pitching that the White Sox have, a lot of young talent coming up. They've got even more guys behind those guys. And him going to AAA, interesting to me because I thought they were going to protect all of their their bigger name prospects, like especially those guys they acquired last year, and keep them in double A and avoid the band box that is triple A, where pitchers seem to get beat up. But they may they must want to see what he can do there, or they're trying to break up a little bit of the log jam in double A with Birmingham. He's on a very different track, let's say, from Edgar Caro, who looks awesome, right? Looks like he's gonna be an absolute beast when he gets here you're already penciling him in as your starting catcher for years to come I I know I am I'm looking at him going okay I love Corey Lee and when Edgar Carroll gets here I don't know how long it'll be before Edgar Carroll takes the job and Corey Lee is his backup because you look you, you, I mean you look at where he is on the prospect list you look at that potential you forget that Lee was a first round draft choice and you immediately go okay well watch out for Edgar Carroll who immediately shows up in AAA and hits a bomb and it's like, okay, it's only a matter of time till he gets here. The difference between him and Bush, though, is a catcher coming up to the majors is such a thing. 
Like to the point where so many other organizations have started to take their big catching prospect and have him stand in the outfield or DH for a while to get used to the hitting aspect before they even let them get used to running a staff. It's it's the longest process, I think, for a player coming from AAA to the majors to be a Major League Baseball player, Ed. Yeah, it's one of those where I, you know, the catching position is so important from a defensive standpoint that sometimes what these teams are doing is they're sitting there going, I love this guy's bat. I want the bat off here now. There's nothing for him to prove down there in AAA. There's nothing for him to prove down there in AA even. And and to, to, I just want to see what he can do up here. So we're going to DH him. We're going to put him in the outfield. Uh, we're going to put him at first base, whatever it is. And sometimes that is a – it's because this guy just is not improving defensively. He's not catching on to how to catch, Okay. It's, it's, he doesn't move well. He doesn't frame well. Pop times are bad. Um, you know, there's all sorts of reasons. So, you know, to the extent that Edgar Caro is not undergoing that and that he is still showing improvement defensively and he is showing an aptitude towards being behind the plate, when he comes up here, you would expect if those things are equal and are, are consistent with what Corey Lee brings, that Caro's bat would slot in at the catcher position. There's always a possibility that, that they look at Edgar Caro and go, this kid's an athlete. He can play anywhere. We just want him up here. And, you know, they are going to bring him up and they are going to sit there and go, we like what Corey Lee does behind the plate. So these two guys can coexist and we'll find backup catchers. We'll find, you know, supplementary players for, for that catching position. But Corey Lee's the guy. Edgar Caro is now, you know, going to be our primary DH. Or we think Edgar Caro can actually man right field or left field. We think Edgar Caro can do something else on the diamond. And that's happened, you know, Throughout history, heck, Paul Canerco was a catcher at one point in his minor league career. Kyle Schwarber was a catcher uh, when he was drafted by the Cubs, and he, I don't think he's ever caught a, a major league game, or maybe you know, but a few. And, and you know, if you want to dig way back, a guy like Todd Zeal, who was a third baseman for the Cardinals forever, um, he originally came up as a catcher. So it's it's not unprecedented that catchers get moved. But I think what what's interesting is is Edgar Carroll getting you know, more exposure to quad A pitching, right? Guys who have been in the majors, guys who have strategized a little bit more, um, guys who are, are, you know, in that position where they kind of are good enough to be, you know, a, a factor in the depth of your organization, but suck hard enough that it's really difficult on a catcher to make them be anything. So, I, you know, I, I think that's going to be the test for Edgar Carroll. Meanwhile, a guy like Brooks Baldwin, you know, it's just a question of, well, what is this guy? And let's find out at a different level. Or Kai Bush, what is this guy? Let's find out at a different level and see how he handles this situation. Because maybe it's one of those things where, you know, they're looking at Bush going, we like what he's doing against the double-A batters, but we want to see him against some guys who have been up in the majors, or we want to see him against that next level to see if this is a bullpen piece, to see if this is a starting piece, or just, like you said, just to move the logjam along. Because the good news is you do have guys. Right, you do have a Mason Adams there. You do have Noah Schultz, who's who's doing really, really well, and looks like he might live up to his potential. So, there's a lot of things you can read into it, but I mean, ultimately, it's it's just they've made the move, they've moved guys around to the minors, and now you look at it and you say, "Okay, kid, show me what you got," and let's see where let's see where this goes down the road. And and I don't think at this point I'm willing to pencil anybody into anything. Because I'm still jaded from the prospect train that's come along before, where it's like once this guy arrives, he's really going to be a right. Uh, exactly, like you're, you're he's sitting really going to arrive. You're sitting there thinking to yourself, like, oh, that's great. And when he gets here, he'll just be no good because that, that's how you're. Because that's what we. But I that's feel, what we've done. But I feel good every time a pitcher comes up right now. Like I'm, I'm almost overconfident when right. a pitcher comes up right now. And so I'm curious how the players will go. The guy that I find really interesting, and that, that's the third guy that I mentioned, was Brooks Baldwin, because look, I, I'm not a prospect guy. I, you know, we bring prospect guys on the show to talk about prospects because sometimes all I got is, well, this is where he was drafted. This is what he did. And I'm fascinated by a guy who was was basically in rookie ball in 2022, didn't do anything spectacular at all. Looks terrible at the plate, right? And then he's in Kannapolis and he's hitting 245. And you're like, all right. I mean, he's he's a nobody. I mean, he's at the he's 24th right now on MLB pipeline as a prospect. And then he gets to Winston Salem, high A ball, and hits 327. And then he gets to Birmingham. And he's hitting 322, and now he's on his way to Charlotte. And he's had these very small sample sizes that Winston Salem 327 is over 101 at bats, and they're like promote him. Like <laughs> to me, like as, right. a, as a Sox fan, I go, huh? Like what? 
You, you just expected him to – like, if I look at that, I go, well, then he's going to get killed in Birmingham. But he didn't get killed in Birmingham. He hits 322 with an 827 OPS, over 286 at-bats, and, like, send that kid to Charlotte. And now you would expect him to actually hit well in Charlotte because we keep talking about it. That division and that ballpark is is all about hitters. You know what I'm saying? Like you expect well, that's, him. That's Triple A in general. Yeah, he he should be able to perform really well. Again, this is why you're worried about Colson Montgomery because you're like, oh, he should be killing it down there. You should be worried about whether or not it's fool's gold. Not looking at him going, well, I would just hope he turns it around here in the second half. This kid's going to show up now, and he's like one of these out of nowhere type prospects. And I'm not like to me, he's out of nowhere just because of how quickly it's rising, how quickly he's moving. And it's, it's strange to me of how fast he's moving along. But now you see some people penciling him in as like, oh, we'll look for him to be in the uh, on the roster next year. He could be the second baseman next year. And and so, again, that's something I'm going to talk with James Fox about when we come in and we do the, the draft preview next week because I look at a Brooks Baldwin and I go, well, I can't get that excited, can I? This is a White Sox prospect. They're not supposed to be that good. Nobody's supposed, no. nobody's supposed to come out of nowhere and be discovered and developed that quickly in this system. That's not how things work here. No, and, and you know, you can get into things too, like some some prospect guys will parse about age, you know, and, and is he age appropriate for the level? He's only 23 years old, so I don't think that that's an issue. Um, he's a college kid. And, and so, you know, his college career, 180 games in college where he hits 298, he's got an 849 OPS. His minor league career, over 195 games, he's hit 283. And he's got a 782 OPS. So you sit there and go, okay, well, that that seems to track. Like, this is what this is. I worry about small sample sizes overall with minor league guys because I, – I, and I call it the Andrew Vaughn effect because you can sit there and say, as talented a hitter as they are, if they haven't shown that they can handle everything at, at every level, then there's, there's really no point. And when you get a guy like Vaughn who had such a small sample size in the minors in general and didn't see multiple levels, it kind of gives you pause. You know, the other thing, too, is when I look at a minor league guy, and I and I, I use this as a predictor probably more than I should, and, and I, I imagine James Fox would probably tell me I'm wrong about it, but I look at the strikeout rates that somebody has down in the minors, and if they're caying an awful lot, that tells me that they're just running into bad pitching. And when they, when they get a bad pitcher, they're punishing them. And when Brooks Baldwin, who's sporting a 20% strikeout rate for his minor league career, gets to triple a if he continues to maintain consistency with where he's been at his best with double a at his best with high a then i tend to sit there and say okay he's got a chance to show up in the majors and be serviceable at a minimum he's got a chance to show up and do something up here and and so you know that's that gives me some level of of hope for the future but you know until we see years and years of this until we see a front office that consistently produces guys and not just the top two picks in a draft, not just the top international signings, but consistently produces 12th round guys, you know, fifth round guys here, whatever, you know, just this minor league guys that come in, have some level of talent, are able to put it together, are able to carry over what got them drafted in the first place and adapt to the game and become major league players until we see that consistently from the White Sox over the span of five, 10 years, anything that, that gets brought up, it's just always going to be for me. I'll watch, I'll cheer for the, for the kid. I'll, I'll pull for him. But until you prove it to me, I don't believe in anything. You don't trust it. You, you trust the pitching thing. I trust the pitching thing because Brian Bannister had a track record. I trust the pitching thing because I'm seeing guys that are coming in. And yo, look, it's not perfect, but they're young. But I've liked what I've seen out of Drew Thorpe overall. I've liked what I've seen out of Jonathan Cannon overall. Okay, I, I don't think that the book is closed on Nick Nestrini, although he looks like he's more likely going to be a, a bullpen guy. Look at, look at how they've changed. I mean, he's not signed next year. But Mike Soroka, since he got into the bullpen, look at look at the difference in his numbers. He's been just really, really good. There's some good stuff happening in terms of not only pitching development, but fixing pitchers, finding the right mix of pitches. That, that, that's that been one of the, the positive things going on in a season of negatives is the pitching. And it, it I become just kind of like a like a pitching ophile. Like I'm just like I'm in love with this pitching. Like I, I'm it's the it's the one thing that gives me hope. I look at their their depth chart in the minors. I look at where these guys what these guys are doing in triple A and double A and I look at them on their prospect lists. Like when I look at the, the MLB pipeline top thirty list for the White Sox, 
I look at the the all the players on the list, and I will right away look at it. Okay, Schultz is two. Well, he's going to be a pitcher, and I have no reason to believe that it's not going to work out. Drew Thorpe is three. He's going to be a pitcher. I really believe that it's going to work out just fine for him, right? I, 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 but when I look at the players around them, I see Montgomery, and I go, eh, not doing too well. I don't know. I'm excited about Edgar Caro, but here's a guy who's going to have to make that big jump like we just talked about earlier. Brian Ramos, I, I enjoyed having him up here, but remember, he wasn't playing well in the minors before he was promoted out of necessity. He caught fire for a couple of weeks. He dealt with an injury, and he cooled off. And he's back down there again. And I don't know what he'll end up being. Samuel Zavala is a little ways away, just acquired out there. Jacob Gonzalez has fixed his, fixed his swing. But it's not like he's burning double-A up. He's just competent right now in double-A, right? He's hitting like around 270 or something like that. Like, it's interesting when you look at the players, you go, there's not very much there. It goes back to why I keep saying you do need to develop. You do need to continue to, to acquire talent. You do need to continue to build but also, that's why I feel really confident that next year you could use the money from Moncada and Jimenez to go out and get a couple of professional hitters. I keep using Anthony Santander as an example, but there's like that's just because he's going to be so far down the list when you're looking at outfielders and hitters that he's not going to get that big money, but he should easily fall within your range. So he's an example, not the, guy, not the only guy they can go get. But I, I'm, I'm looking at a couple of bats being added to this lineup. Let the young pitching come along. And then you're not going to rush some of these guys who aren't quite ready down in the minor leagues. I don't expect you to win a World Series in 25. You probably aren't even making the playoffs. But you don't need to be a historically bad team out there. And I don't think you're hampering the growth of the White Sox by also teaching the young kids that are up there what it's like to win. Because, I, again, I go back to what I'm watching with Luis Robert Jr., and, and the attitude and the way that he's played the outfield as of late. And you don't want that. You want these young guys when they get up there to like being a part of the White Sox, to taste winning from time to time, to go on a streak every once in a while, to, to, to conduct themselves as Major League Baseball players. You need to grow the thing of this is the White Sox way of doing things, and we do play fundamentally sound baseball. So that's why you still have to maintain and have a fairly good team on the field year to year while you're developing these guys down in the minor leagues. That's why I hate the idea of tear down to the studs rebuilds. That's why I hate the idea of moving on from guys that are good that have several years of control you can still be a viable baseball team that isn't going to win any championships but it might be fun to go to the ballpark and also you can grow the culture in the building so that when you are finally ready to take that next step you're not sitting around saying well we've got a bunch of stars but they don't know how to play it's development it's coaching and right now the white Sox have found something in the minors with the pitching development and coaching they haven't found it with the hitting, and they sure as heck haven't found it, fundamental base running and fielding. So now we're going to go out and get a really old manager like Tony La Russa to come in, and he's going to make them all into players. That didn't work. Don't do it again. And it's time for the Sox Nerd, brought to you by the Village of Lamont. Want to experience a downtown with real history, great eats and drinks, and green space filled with adventure, especially here in the summertime? Well, visit the Village of Lamont. Shop, dine, drink, explore, and visit LamontDowntown.com for all the info. Nerd, what you got for us this week? Ed, before June gets away from us, I'd like to offer a few nuggets from the month. Garrett Crochet had one of the best Junes in White Sox history despite a 500 record. In six starts, the lefty was 1-1 one one with a 1.91 ERA. In 37 and two-thirds innings, Crochet gave up just 29 hits and six walks while fanning 56. Opponents slashed just 209, 250, and 266 against him, and his whip was a minuscule 0.92. Crochet's 56 strikeouts are the third highest June total in Sox history behind that cutup Chris Sale's 75 in 2015 and Ed Walsh's 68 in 1911. His average of 13.38 strikeouts per nine innings is second only to Sale's 15.2 in 2015, and his 9.3 strikeout-to-walk ratio was third best in team annals. By the way, Crochet led the majors in strikeouts and strikeouts per nine innings in the month. How about Crochet's consistency in June? He pitched into the sixth inning in each of his six starts and never allowed more than three runs. In addition, Crochet did not walk more than two batters in any start, and he whiffed at least six batters in each assignment. And for all that, and probably more, Crochet was named the American League Pitcher of the Month for June. 
He is the first Sox hurler to win this award since Dylan Cease went back-to-back in June and July of 2022, and he is the first lefty to win it since Sale in June of 2019. In addition, Crochet is the first Sox pitcher to win this award in his first year as a starter. I'd keep him, Ed, if only for the reason that he is appointment viewing. Andrew Vaughn was by far the Sox best hitter in June. The Cal product slashed 337, 371, and 561 with six homers, two more than he had entering the month, and 20 RBIs, which was one more than he had entering the month in June. Vaughn needed this month. He entered June hitting a paltry 199. While he did not have the historical month Crochet had, Vaughn's 337 average is one of the Sox best in June in the last 20 years or so. In fact, only Jose Abreu's 346 in 2022, Alex Rios' 346 in 2012, and Paul Canerco's 340 in 2002 were better June outputs than Vaughn's number. It's almost unfair to give a Sox hitter, or any hitter for that matter, it's almost unfair to give a Sox hitter, or any hitter for that matter, historical context in June, because I don't think there's ever going to be anyone who even remotely approaches the month Joe Jackson had in 1916. That June, the shoeless one hit 512. That's 44 for 86. Before I get to my zinger, a reminder, you can access my blog at SocksInTheBasement.com, and there's plenty of Socks nerd material on Twitter and on the scoreboard at Guaranteed Rate Field. My zinger, Luis Robert clubbed a 470-foot homer in the Sox 11-3 win over Colorado on June 29th. That was the fifth longest at the Sox current park with Joe Borchard's 504-foot blast on August 30th, 2004 being the longest. Did you know, Ed, the longest home run in White Sox history is purported to be a roof shot by Dave Swish Nicholson at the Old Park on May 6, 1964. According to the Sox media guide the following year, Nicholson's bomb cleared the left field roof and carried an estimated 573 feet. That's it, Ed. More than you probably wanted to know about Crochet, Walsh, Vaughn, and Roofers. I don't know if I could hit a ball 573 feet if you spotted me multiple hits. I don't know if I could hit one 573 inches. That was quite a blast. Yeah, it really was. I did see Joe Borchard's blast when it happened. I was, I was at that game. That was pretty impressive, but... Well, hey, you know what? Sounds like June was a good month for at least two White Sox players. Maybe two more White Sox players could have a good July. Let's pray for that. No, well, I'm not much of a praying man, but in this case, I'll, I'll give it a whirl. All good. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on SocksInTheBasement.com.